A very warm welcome to all the students. This is our lecture number 68 on the series Indian Polity by M. Lakshmikant. So before I continue with this particular lecture, so let me address certain queries that the students has brought in front of me. Personally, they have messaged me also and I could see few comments also where the students has been asking what should I follow. So this is not only from the students uh, who are following this particular series, but also my old students have also been asking me that the new series of Lakshmikan, that is the seventh edition is already there in the market. Should we go through the seventh edition of Lakshmikan or the sixth edition? Now for students who are not started prepared, they can go through the seventh edition, but the students who are already prepared or who have been preparing using the sixth edition, they can continue with that. There's no issue because not much is going to change. Most of the things in the Indian constitution is already covered in the Lakshmikan right from the edition one. It is only that few years that they have been adding few topics here and there, uh, which is not uh, directly to the constitution. Certain periphery topics has been added over the years just to improve upon the standards of the book. So you really don't have to worry about that if you already purchased the previous edition. So it doesn't mean that if the seventh edition is there that the students who are preparing with the sixth edition uh, uh, has to completely re redo their preparation. No, if you want, you can just look into the additions in the seventh edition. You can just take the photocopy of the additions in the 7th edition, which is not there in the 6th edition and you can do that. So coming back to the lectures, I have already promised the students that I will just go through the uh, 7th edition and then whatever is the update in case if it is found to be valuable and if it is really that the students should know about that, I will make a supplementary video on all those additions in the topics that I have already covered especially in the topic of fundamental rights and uh, the topics like union territory, citizenship and all those things. There will not be any change in the historical underpinning. There will not be any change in the preamble. There will not be any change much with regard to the citizenship. So probably there can be some changes in the fundamental rights. Let me just go through the text. If there's any valuable addition, I'll just make a supplementary video. But uh, moving forward for the other chapters, I'll follow the uh, seventh edition so that uh, the students can follow that as well because but whatever is there in the sixth edition is almost there in the seventh edition as well subject has few chapters has been added but they are entirely new chapters so those new chapters can be added uh, read by the other students also anyways they are following the sixth edition so let me just go through the book and then i'll just come out with the videos in case if it is required so this is what i wanted to convey to the uh, students before i proceed with today's lecture and as I already told today's lecture is we are going to practice few questions because this examination is equally about practicing the question it is not only about having a knowledge and you have to test your knowledge regularly rather so you can uh, practice the questions here then you have to practice the previous year questions probably I would suggest that you should practice someone who is very serious about the examination probably they have to practice at least minimum 10 years of previous year question topic wise when you cover certain topics substantially take the last 10 years of uh, question and start solving that for the prelims examination and if you have the time I would say you can go up to last 20 25 years of previous year question and do multiple revisions by multiple revisions a lot of connections get established in your mind and then you can retain that information for a long period of time and most of the times uh, the same the theme gets repeated in the examination if not the same uh, question it also gets repeated in the examination so that it makes your preparation much better effective so that's one kind of suggestion from my side. So let us try to solve few practice questions today. So uh, as I already said, we are right now in lecture number 68 and we already passed almost 67 lectures, which to me is a landmark and students have been continuously following and thanks for the students for doing this. As we'll proceed with this lecture, I'm very sure that uh, we can add a lot of value to the students' uh, preparation and make their preparation much more stronger and also help them in understanding various conceptual clarity related to Indian polity. So today let me just uh, solve few questions. Uh, I'm trying to cover all these topics, few questions from all these topics so that uh, just to see as to to what extent you are in a position to recollect the information. So in the last class itself I told you to revise the things to come but even if you have not revised it's okay. Now you will be able to understand the things, recall the things. But if you're not able to recall most of the things, then it is a reminder to you that you'll have to go back and revise the things. Okay. So I'm planning to cover constituent assembly. So these are the topics that I'm planning to cover. 
so i'm planning to <coughs> cover the constituent assembly uh, preamble union and its territories citizenship fundamental rights dpsp and the fundamental duties because all these has been covered in the last 67 lectures so i'll try to few uh, solve few questions let us see to what extent you are able to recollect these questions so it will be like few questions i will solve few questions i want the students to solve and put the answers in the comment box let me see that how many students are able to answer all these questions and if you have any queries you can also reach out to me so let me just go to the first question so what is the first question look into the first question consider the following statements regarding the constituent assembly of india so this question is from the topic constituent assembly so come to the first statement the assembly was completely an elected body so the key word here is completely and an elected body so is it completely an elected body we have seen that it is not a completely elected body because there were few nominations in the constituent assembly so to say that it is a completely elected body is a wrong statement come to statement number two the members of the constituent assembly was elected through universal adult franchise in fact we know that the members of the constituent assembly were elected indirectly they were not elected by universal adult franchise there was an indirect election in fact the members of the constituent assembly came from both the provinces so there were representation both from the provinces as well as the princely states so this is something that you have already learned so try to recollect whatever you have learned so from the provinces it was through election but this election was an indirect election it was an indirect election they were elected from by the elected members of the legislative assemblies in those provinces so it was an indirect election and in the princely states it was by way of a nomination and nobody was elected by universal adult franchise so this particular statement is also wrong come to the third statement the constant assembly had representation only from the british provinces so again i told that it did not have representation only from the british provinces it also had representation from the princely states the british india then was a combination of these two areas one is the british provinces and other is the princely states so there were representation from both the things so this particular statement is also wrong so which of the statements given above is are incorrect so we'll have to understand so which of the statements is are incorrect so the incorrect statements would be which of the following statements is are incorrect so rather some mistakes in the question so rather the incorrect statement should be all of the above so let me just change it so here it should be all of the above so because all the statements are incorrect so statement one the assembly completely is an elected body is incorrect the members of the constant assembly was elected through universal adult franchise that is also incorrect the constant assembly had representation only from the british provinces that is also incorrect so which of the statements given above are incorrect in fact all of the above let me just change the option so all of the above all the three statements are incorrect so come to the next question so let me just move on to the next question okay before go to uh, going to this, uh, question number two as it has been already informed uh, for the month of july the next batch is to be launched and the batch is likely to commence from 22nd june sorry 22nd july and this would be an evening batch as the name suggests it's a prelims to interview batch it has all the features right from prelims till the interview stage and the courses will be in all the three languages that is in english english and hindi language and students according to their convenience if they wish to join they can join the courses before 22nd july 2023 and if you want an additional discount on any of these courses you can use my code babula so come to question number two so we'll just move on to the question number two consider the following statements regarding the provisions of the constitution so i want the students to solve this particular question so statement one is saying creation of new states in india by recognizing the existing territory can be done only by the parliament of india so now the question is here the reorganization can be done only by the parliament or it can be done by the state legislature also so this is the thing that you have to understand so whether it can be done only by the parliament or it can be done by both parliament and the state legislature so try to identify the answers whether it is parliament or state legislature come to statement number two a union territory can be conferred the status of a state by an act of parliament but the vice versa is not possible 
that is the statement is saying an union territory can be made as a state but can a state be made as an union territory that's the question now take the example of jammu and kashmir can it be converted can a state be converted into an union territory can a union territory be converted into a state now delhi is asking that it wanted to have a state it, it should be given a statehood so think of all these examples and try to answer this particular question statement number three the approval of the concerned state legislature is mandatory before reorganizing the states. So, for example, Telangana was created from Andhra Pradesh. So, before creating Telangana, is it mandatory to take the approval of the concerned state legislature? So, before creating Telangana, was it mandatory to take the approval of the state legislature of Andhra Pradesh? So, all these are being asked. So, you can answer the question which of the statements given above is not correct? You will have to identify. Of the three statements, which of the statement is correct? Whether one is correct, two is correct, or only three is correct. So there are four options given. Both one and two are correct. One only correct. One and three only correct. Three only correct. So you can understand. And accordingly, you can say as to what is the right answer. So just put the right answer in the comment box. Let me see how many of the students are getting this particular answer right. So to answer this, you should have a proper conceptual understanding. But anyways, I already given the hint for this particular question. So you can just answer this particular question. Come to question number three. Consider the following statements regarding the preamble to the constitution of India. If you talk of the preamble to the constitution of India, the question is centered around the preamble to the constitution. So what the question is asking, they are the key to unravel the minds of the makers of the constitution. The preamble is in fact uh, described in number of ways. The preamble is considered to be the uh, summary of the constitution, it is considered to be the philosophy of the constitution and it has been described in a number of other ways also. So now the question is, is the preamble considered to be a key to unravel the minds of the makers of the constitution? Of course, this is how the Supreme Court of India has said as to what the preamble is. So this is the exact uh, explanation or this is the way that the Supreme Court of India has summarized the preamble to the constitution of India. So this particular statement is true. Statement two, they are integral part of the constitution, but neither they give nor they take away the powers of the organs of the state. That means does the preamble give powers to any of the organs? Does it give power to the legislature? Does it give power to the executives? Based on what is mentioned in the preamble, is it possible for the parliament to make certain laws? Is it possible for the executives to make certain executive actions? that is absolutely not possible. So it neither gives a power nor it takes away the power. So that is also not happening in the preamble. What is a preamble? A preamble is merely a key to understand the minds of the makers of the constitution. So they are an integral part of the constitution, but they neither give power nor they take away the power. So that is also true. They can be amended without any restrictions. So can the preamble be amended? That's the question. The Supreme Court in the Kesha Bharati case in 1973 has made it very clear, yes, that the preamble can be amended. The preamble can be amended, but there are few restrictions that the way that the preamble can be amended. And in fact, this restriction is not only to the preamble. This restriction is there upon the parliament to amend any provisions of the constitution. And what is that restriction that the Supreme Court has put it? The Supreme Court said, that the parliament has, has the power to amend the constitution, but the parliament cannot amend the basic structure of the constitution. That means if any provisions of the preamble is considered to be part of the basic structure, then those provisions cannot be amended. So that's the restriction that is not only to the preamble, that is to the entire constitution in fact. So they can be amended without any restriction to say is wrong, because some of the provisions, some of the words in the preamble has already declared to be part of the basic structure. The words like sovereignty, the words like republic, the words like democracy has already been declared to be part of basic structure. So those provisions can never be amended. And to say that the preamble can be amended in total, it's completely a wrong statement. So which of the statements given above are incorrect? So we'll have to identify the incorrect statements. So if you see the incorrect statements, the incorrect statement would be option C. Okay, C is the right answer. That is three only because the other two statements are right. Come to the next statement. I want the students to answer this particular question. Just have a look into this particular question. So what is this particular question is about? So consider the following statements. 
the constitution of india allows its citizens to possess multiple citizenship of different countries at the same time so the question that you have to answer is does the constitution allows for does the constitution allows for multiple citizenship is it possible does or the constitution allows for multiple citizenship is it possible so just think and answer this particular question so statement number two only the persons born in india can acquire the indian citizenship so is it not possible for the others to acquire the indian citizenship tomorrow no foreigner can he or she become an indian citizenship so think about it look into the provisions of the citizenship act 1955 citizenship by birth citizenship by descent citizenship by naturalization registration incorporation of territory we have seen all those things so with this you see whether a foreigner can become an indian citizen or not okay so then the third statement is only citizen of india will have the right to vote in the general elections in india is it true to say that only the citizen of india will have the right to vote in the elections can a foreigner will he or she have the right to vote in the general elections the 2024 lok sabha elections are coming so see whether it is only the citizens or even the foreigners in india will have the right to vote in the elections so with this uh, information that i have given just think about that and try to answer this particular question which of the statements given above are incorrect you have to understand the incorrect statement so of the three statements which is correct that you will leave and the incorrect statement should be the answers okay so let me just uh, eliminate two things i am just eliminating uh, option b and option d so we have to answer between option a and option c so either of these options is the right option you can accordingly choose the right answer come to the next question what is a majority that is required in the parliament to amend the provisions of the citizenship amendment act 1955 and to answer this particular question it is very simple if you have already listened to our previous lectures you will understand that the citizenship act is an ordinary legislation it's an ordinary law it's an ordinary law it does not require a constitutional amendment and any ordinary law or any ordinary legislation requires what it requires just a simple majority because a special majority is required only in case of a constitutional amendment an absolute majority is required for certain other purposes which is in combination of the special majority for any ordinary legislation what is a majority that it is only the simple majority and what is a simple majority it is just the majority of members present as well as voting in the house that is basically what is the simple majority so the question is pretty simple if you provided know that that the ordinary laws requires what is called as a simple majority and that the citizenship amendment act is just an ordinary legislation if you have this information then it becomes very easy which you already discussed so the right answer is option a now why i put this particular question the citizenship amendment act 2019 Now, Citizenship Amendment Act 2019, it was amended. What majority was required? The majority that is required is only the simple majority. And we already discussed about the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019 as well in our previous lectures. Come to the next question. Okay, this is a very good question. That uh, recently India has exchanged some of its Indian enclaves. So, what is an enclave? I already discussed this. enclave is a small part of a country or a small territory of one country which is completely located inside the territory of another country say for example let us assume this let us assume this is india okay let me just uh, redraw this particular thing suppose let us assume this is india and suppose let us assume this is bangladesh this is india this is bangladesh suppose let us assume some tiny territories of india these are all tiny territories of india but which is inside the border of bangladesh completely surrounded by bangladesh and similarly there are certain territories of bangladesh which is inside the border of india now now you will understand that these territories are what is called as enclaves
these territories are what is called as the enclaves. So this is exactly what you have to understand by enclaves. Now recently India has exchanged some of its enclaves with Bangladesh and Bangladesh has given some of its enclaves because here you can understand that if some of the Indian territories in the Bangladesh side, naturally it becomes difficult for the Indian authorities to provide these services here. It's very, very difficult to provide these services here, right? And similarly, the Bangladesh people who are staying in the enclaves inside India, it is also difficult for Bangladesh government to provide these services to its people. And for this very particular reason, they decided that we will exchange the enclaves. A land boundary agreement was signed and a constitutional amendment has subsequently happened in our constitution. And accordingly, today the enclaves has been exchanged. But now the question is not about the exchange of enclaves. The question is about what will happen to those people who are there in the Bangladesh enclaves in India. So there were few people of the Bangladesh enclaves so they were staying in these enclaves and they are basically Bangladesh citizens. Now, can they become the Indian citizen? And if they are to become an Indian citizen, what is the provision by which they can become the Indian citizen? That's see, right things and what is the most appropriate answer in this particular case? Can they become an Indian citizen? By naturalization, registration, incorporation of territory or any of the above. That's the question. Okay, so try to think about this particular question and try to uh, give an answer for this particular question. So what is the most appropriate answer in this particular case as to how they can uh, become the Indian citizen in this particular case? All right. I hope the question is very clear. Let me just move on to the next question. So go on to question number seven. Which of the following is are the features of the fundamental rights provided in part three of the constitution? So the part three talks about the fundamental rights. We have already seen six themes of fundamental rights. Which of the followings are the features of the fundamental rights? So basically you should know the features. One, they cannot be amended by the parliament. Of course they can be amended by the parliament. Many fundamental rights has been amended. Article 21A was inserted. Right to property was taken away. So directly you can eliminate this. Statement two. They check the arbitrary exercise of power by the state. Of course, it limits the powers of the state. That's the intention as to why the fundamental rights has been brought in. So they check the arbitrary exercise of the power. This is true. They provide absolute protection to the citizens. We know that the fundamental rights are not absolute in character because the fundamental rights comes with what is called as the reasonable restrictions. There are reasonable restrictions, in fact, to all the fundamental rights. And what is the reason why these reasonable restrictions are there? These reasonable restrictions are there, in fact, to balance between fundamental rights and the societal welfare. And hence, there are reasonable restrictions. So, to say that they provide absolute protection to the citizens, that is wrong. So, choose the correct options from the codes given below. So, we'll have to correct the right one. So, what seems to be the right one? If you eliminate one and three, you are just left with. That is option D, that is 2 only. That's the right answer. Come to the next question. So consider the following statements. Again, a very question, a good question. A constitutional amendment can be challenged in a court of law for the violation of fundamental rights. That means the question is saying, can a constitutional amendment be challenged in a court just because it has violated some of the fundamental rights? Now, please understand for which we'll have to understand Article 13 of the Constitution. Go back to your Article 13 of the Constitution. Article 13 of the Constitution says, any law, and if that law is in violation of fundamental rights, they can be declared to be null and void. So this is what Article 13 says. Article 13 is trying to give a position of primacy to the fundamental rights. Now, the question that you have to understand here is, what is this law? This law includes ordinary law or this law also includes what is called as the constitutional law. So, if you know this, then you can answer this particular question. Just go back to your previous notes. Just go back to the previous lectures. Just revise and then try to answer this particular question. In case of any queries, you can put it in the comments or you can reach out to me in my Instagram account or in my Telegram channel. 
So I'll try to give you the answer. But try to approach this particular question. So see whether statement one is right or wrong. Two. A constitutional amendment can be amended. Sorry, a constitutional amendment can amend any provisions of the constitution, including the fundamental rights, without any limitation. So this is a very easy thing. So the idea here is to test whether the parliament has an unlimited power to amend the constitution, or is there any limitation upon the powers of the parliament to amend the constitution? So just think about this uh, particular question, a beautiful question which has uh, the same theme has been number of times asked in the preliminary examination. You can think about this and you can give your answer to this particular question. All right. So, in the meantime, I'll just proceed to the next question. So, I'm not solving it because I wanted the students to solve these questions, some of the important questions which will give them a proper conceptual understanding. Okay, come to the next thing. Which of the following fundamental rights are not available to the alien? So, who is an alien? So, anyone who's not a citizen is an alien not a citizen so if he is not a citizen then he is an alien so that means which of the following fundamental rights are available to which of the following fundamental rights are not available or not available to the aliens so there are certain fundamental rights which are available only to the citizens you should remember this by heart so what are those fundamental rights article 15 article 16 article 19 Article 29 and Article 30. So remember this by heart. So these fundamental rights are to owe only to the citizens. So other fundamental rights are available to both citizens as well as aliens, but this is only to the citizens. Now, what is Article 15? No discrimination on certain grounds, on the grounds of religion, race, caste, sex. What is Article 16? Equality of opportunity in matters of public employment. What is Article 19? Right to freedom on certain things so right to freedom of speech and expression then association right to protest then you have right to freedom of movement residence profession and all those things article 29 and article 30 they are considered to be the cultural and educational rights of the minorities so all these things are only to the citizens they are not for the alien now come to the question right to life and liberty is there in article 21 so this is not only to the citizens it is to both the foreigners as well as aliens so which is not available so this is available to the alien so this is not the right one right to freedom of movement this is available only to the citizens so because of not this is the right one equal opportunities in matters of public employment article 16 this is not available right to freedom of speech and expression again article 19 this is not available no discrimination by the state on the grounds of religion race caste sex place of birth so this is basically article 15 so this is also not available so choose the correct options from the quotes given below so what would be the right answer in this case so if you eliminate one apart from one everything is the right answer the right answer is option d so try to remember this very very important okay come to the next question so i wanted the students to answer this particular question so come to question number 10 if you see question number 10 the concept behind this particular question is very simple what is the concept the fundamental right to freedom of speech and expression, which is guaranteed under Article uh, 19, Class 1, Sub Clause A, a right to freedom of speech and expression is given to all the citizens. But if you look into the Constitution, this right to freedom of speech and expression is not an absolute right. In fact, this right to freedom of speech and expression can be restricted on eight grounds as per Article 19, Class 2. So you should remember what is this eight grounds on which this right to freedom of speech and expression can be restricted. So among these things which is part of these eight grounds and which is not part of the eight grounds it is talking about disturbance to public order incitement to offense against the decency and morality defamation contempt of the court or they part of these eight restrictions so that is the thing that you should know to answer this particular question so put your answers in the comment box and tell me what is the right answer in this particular case among these four options that is a b c and d okay now come to the question number 11. So question number 11 is talking about the minority rights granted under Article 30 of the Constitution. So you already seen that Article 29 and Article 30 is for the minorities. But within that, the Supreme Court of India has clarified, while Article 30 is only for the minorities, Article 29 is not only for the minorities, 
but it is for any section of citizens. I have explained this. You can just go and watch the lectures. So article 29 is for any section of citizens having a distinct language, script and culture. But article 30 is only for the minorities. And if you see article 30, article 30 is only for the minorities and these minorities should be from only two categories. One is religious minorities and the other is the linguistic minority. So what is the basis on which the minorities are identified? It can be either on the basis of religion or on the basis of language. So either a religious minority or a linguistic minority. So that's a basic idea you should have. It should be either a religious minority or a linguistic minority. But how to identify minority? There are many people or people from various religious communities, the people from various linguistic uh, communities. So among them who are considered to be minorities, so just go back to our discussion on article 30 and the guideline that should, was given by the supreme court whether the entire country should be taken as a geographical entity or it is only that the state has to be taken as a geographical entity to identify the minorities and also once they are declared to be minorities what is the advantage that they have and what is the advantage that the minority educational institutions will have so try to have a overall understanding of all those things so whenever you solve a particular question, it is not that you should just solve that particular question when you prepare for UPSC. You should also solve everything around that particular theme. Just not just the question because there's a possibility anything from that particular theme can be asked in the examination. So you should cover the entire theme when you solve the questions. Okay, now coming back to the question, you can say that the minority rights granted under Article 30 of the Constitution is based on what? It is based on religion and language. There is no culture that is mentioned in the constitution, especially under Article 30 of the constitution. So you can just eliminate that. You can just rule out that. Choose the correct answers from the quotes given below. If you see the correct answers from the quotes given below, so if you can rule out uh, three, so what is uh, left? So you are left with option C, that is one and two only. So one and two only is the right answer. Come to the next question. So next question is basically about the EWS reservation. So recently the economically weaker sections reservation, we have elaborately dealt with this economically weaker sections. So EWS reservation was inserted into the constitution by the 103rd Constitutional Amendment Act in the year 2018 rather. So 2018, so the 103rd Constitutional Amendment Act was inserted. So what is the idea of this EWS reservation? So you should know about this EWS reservation as well. And what this EWS reservation is all about. So let us try to briefly recollect as to what this EWS reservation. So EWS reservation was recently in news. So this EWS reservation actually provides reservation to whom? That's the question. So I want the students to answer this particular question. I have very well explained as to what is the criteria for this EWS reservation. Today, who can exercise and enjoy this EWS reservation? We have discussed that as well. Whether the EWS reservation is only available to the uh, general category, that is the economically weaker sections among the general category, or the EWS reservation is available to the other backward cost, scheduled cost, and the scheduled tribe. So this is something. So whether it is available to everyone or it is not available to everyone is what we we'll have to understand. So who is eligible to get reservation under the EWS reservation? what the supreme court of india has said with regard to the ews reservation so we already explained all those things and also most importantly what is the criteria as to to see whether somebody falls under the ews reservation or not so all these things are required in order to answer this particular question today the supreme court of india has given its stamp and approval to what is called as ews reservation they have said that yes that the state can give what is called as ews reservation it was challenged in front of the Supreme Court. A constitutional bench sat on that. In fact, this EWS reservation was challenged on the ground that it is violative of the basic structure of the constitution. The Supreme Court said that it does not violate any of the basic structure. You can go ahead with the EWS reservation. And they also clarified as to who is eligible to get the EWS reservation. So let us try to understand the options here. Economically weaker sections of the society including the scheduled cost, scheduled tribe in both educational and the public employment. So I can definitely say this particular statement is wrong. I'm not going to give the answer, but let me just try to eliminate a couple of options. Economically weaker sections of the society, excluding 
the scheduled cast, scheduled tribe, OBC community, only in the educational institutions. So this is also wrong. So the answer has to be either option C or option D. I wanted you to go through option C and option D and put the answers in the comment box as to what is the right answer. And to answer it, you should have a proper understanding of what constitutes the economically weaker sections reservation. Okay. I'll just move on to the next question that is question number 13. So consider the following statements. So this is with regard to the private reservation or I would say that reservation in the private sector jobs. So recently the state governments like Haryana. So Haryana has already made a law that has uh, provided private sector reservations or jobs in the private sector and they have reserved I think 75% of the jobs in the private sectors to the local residents. So 75% of the jobs in the private sector is reserved to the local residents in the state of Haryana subject to certain income limit that is if the income is uh, less than or equal to 30k 30,000 all those jobs or 75% of those jobs has to be reserved to the local residents. This is what the law that is enacted by the state of Haryana especially with regard to the private sector is saying. So that means if you are reserving the jobs with regard to the local residents that means you are reserving the jobs only for the people residing in that particular state or who are domiciled in that particular state. What about the outsiders? Can they come and take this particular job? If you are not allowing them to take this particular job, does it impact any fundamental right? That's the question we have to understand and answer in this particular question. So the question basically is this law that was made by Haryana recently, does it violate the fundamental rights of the citizens or not? So let us try to understand and unfold the statements first. Reservation in private sector jobs to the residents in the state is violative of fundamental right under Article 16. So does the private sector jobs, does it violate the fundamental right under Article 16? So we have to answer that. Are they violative of Article 16 or they are not violative of Article 16? That is the right to equal opportunities with regard to employment under the state. Now article 16 is very clear article 16 is saying that there shall be equality of opportunity in matters of public employment when we talk of public employment it is an employment under the government and it is not about the private employment so if reservation is done under the private employment it does not definitely affect article 16 of the constitution so reservation in private sector jobs to the residents of a state is violative of the fundamental right so it is not violative of article 16 so you can rule out statement one Statement 2, the constitution empowers a parliament to reserve jobs for the residents of a state in public employment by law. Is it true? Can the parliament make a law and can they reserve the jobs in the government for a local resident in a particular area? That's also very much possible for which we'll have to understand the provisions of article 16 class 3. In fact, article 16 class 3 is an exception to article 16. If you see article 16 class 3, it gives the power to the parliament to reserve certain jobs to the local residents, even if the job is in the government. So that can be very much done. So already we have seen an example of such a law, Public Employment Requirement as to Residents Act 1957. And this law has reserved certain jobs for the local residents in the state of Andhra Pradesh, in the state of Manipur, in the state of Tirupura, in the state of Himachal Pradesh. So that means that is also very much possible because there are exception to article 16 which is in the form of article 16 class 3. So this particular statement is also true. So which of the statements given above is are incorrect. If you talk of incorrect statement that is only option A that is one only is the right answer. So I think out of the 13 questions I think I have solved 7-8 seven, seven, questions. I wanted the student to answer 5 at least 5 to 6 questions. So do answer those questions. There are a few more questions before I wind up the uh, discussion today. So come to the next question. In the Constitution of India, promotion of international peace and security is included in what? So this is uh, from the directive principles of state policy. So do remember article 51 of the Constitution which talks about promotion of international peace and security. So definitely it is not part of the preamble. It is not part of the fundamental duties. And it is also not part of the ninth schedule. So the right answer even if you eliminate the right answer is the directive principles of the state policy. And then I am going to the last question. 
So very good question. In fact, earlier asked in UPSC examination also. The only thing that you have to remember to answer this particular question is that the fundamental duties. So this question is from fundamental duties. So you have to just remember the fundamental duties are non-justiciable in character. Because I already said what these fundamental duties. The fundamental duties are just a moral obligation. They are just a moral obligation. They are not a legal obligation. So they are just a moral obligation for the state. So come to this particular statement. Uh, question number 15. Which of the following statement is or true for the fundamental duties of an Indian citizen? So which of the following statement is or true? of the fundamental duties of an Indian citizen. So, with regard to fundamental duties, which of the following statement is not true? A legislative process has been provided to enforce these duties. That means, is there a special mechanism which is mentioned in the constitution itself to make a law to enforce these duties? So, similar to that of the constitution that provides for a procedure to amend the constitution, is there any special process or a procedure which is laid down in the constitution to make a law to enforce any of these fundamental duties. First question statement. They are correlative to legal duties. That means is there a legal obligation to perform these duties? So if you can answer these two questions, then you will be in a position to answer this particular question. So try to answer this question and try to put your answers. So there are a few questions that, that I have solved and there are a few questions that I have left the students to solve. So the idea is that you participate, you revise, and then if there's any query or concern that you have got with regard to any of these questions, you can reach out to me through my Instagram channel, which is Babu Gunashekran 337 and also in my Telegram channel. Okay. So try to solve all those questions. And if you want, you can just revise the previous areas and you can do it. Or even if you have understood the previous lectures, still you will be in a position to solve most of these questions. And it is extremely, extremely important for you to regularly revise and also to regularly take the test as i already said try to have certain benchmarks at least 10 years of previous upsc question if possible try to go beyond that as well if to be on the safer side i would suggest you do last 25 years of upsc question and do it again and again to get the conceptual clarity and if you do like this for all the subjects not only for polity i would say that you can do it for the other subjects like history as well you can do it for geography as well Economics, yes, to some extent, because economics, a lot of current affairs can also come. But yes, there are a few conventional areas where you can do that. If you do that, at least for the big four subjects, I'm very sure that 2024 preliminary examination is not far away from you. And I'm very sure that in this way, if you prepare, you will definitely are going to crack the 2024 prelims and subsequently the other examinations that are to come as well. That is the mains as well as the interview test, that is a personality test. All the very best to all the students. Thank you very much for watching this particular lecture. God bless. Thank you.